Hey everybody, welcome to the video. So we're breaking down the Hollywood Casino 400 at Kansas Speedway on Sunday, October 18th at around 2.30 p.m. Eastern. But before we continue, as always, if you guys could just leave a like. And I also want to give a quick shout out to the entire NASCAR DFS community because you guys are always the most interactive with my content. You guys leave the most likes, the most comments, and you're also my biggest supporters over on Patreon, which is a huge help to me. So it allows me all this time to make these videos for you guys and make these spreadsheets and write articles and all that stuff. So just want to give a quick shout out to all of you. I really do appreciate that. It does not go unnoticed. And if you're new to the channel, consider the subscribe button. It really helps me out. I post content for Daily Fantasy Sports every single day, whether it's NASCAR, MLB, NFL, or the NBA. So if you're going to be a frequent visitor of the channel, you might as well hit that subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, so you miss out whenever I post new videos. If you want to follow me over on social media, feel free to do that. I'm at ChrisPanel16 on Twitter, CPen16 over on IG. Don't really post uh, per, uh, fantasy stuff over on Instagram. It's more of a personal account. But if you're interested in what I'm eating that day, if I'm working out, if I'm playing Xbox, playing Warzone, whatever, or, what, or whatever me and my girlfriend are doing, feel free to follow me on IG. All my links are down below for that to make it easy. And if you want more content over on Patreon, that's obviously much appreciated. We've got around 300 members right now, and you get access into the entire NASCAR DFS spreadsheet in my Discord chat, and you can uh, get access to my articles as well. I put a lot of time into that each and every single week. There's a ton of stuff here on the NASCAR DFS spreadsheet. I mean, I would go through it all, but I've done that in previous videos, and there's a lot of stuff here. It's got every single thing I use every single week. The only thing externally I use is Fantasy Cruncher to build lineups to upload my stuff to, but everything outside of that is just strictly this spreadsheet, which has a ton of information on here, which I think is very helpful to any NASCAR DFS player. I mean, even people that are experienced with it, or if you're just new to the sport, I think it's pretty much got everything there that would be very beneficial to you guys. And links down below for that if you're interested. But if not, that's fine. Let's just get into the preview of this race. And actually, before we continue, I just want to address something really quick because I have people asking me about live streams and the DraftKings contest every single race. I'm just going to start those back up at the beginning of next year because football is fully taken over. The NASCAR contests are getting smaller, and it's going to be hard to fill the, NAS the DraftKings contest. And also, I don't expect the live stream to get too many questions, which is really that's all it's for, just to hang out with you guys and just be interactive for the most part. Because back when NASCAR was the only sport, we were getting almost 500 people in the live streams at once, which was, which was awesome. <laughs> it was really, really fun. Really, really fun. But... I think we're just gonna start this back up when we hit Daytona and all that stuff back in February. Or in February, so just wanted to address that so people aren't wondering if there's gonna be a contest or if there's gonna be a live stream. We're just gonna move those until the beginning of next season, which is only a few months away. But anyway, this is the Hollywood Casino 400. There's your outline of the track. This is Kansas Speedway. It's an intermediate track. It's one and a half miles in length, so you know it's just your typical 1.5 mile track. It's also low tire wear. There's 267 laps, which means we have 200.25 dominator points available. Not a ton, but not like a few where we don't have to worry about dominators. We certainly need dominators in our lineups. We're looking at anywhere from 1 to 3. And I say 1 to 3 because if you use... Because Kyle Busch, he's kind of in a weird spot this week where he's starting 20th. Because I kind of view him as a place differential dominator hybrid. But for the most part, you're gonna, you have to have at least one dominator. You're not going to get away with it just with place differential plays. But 3 might be pushing it. But I was playing around with some lineups, and just to name a few guys off the top of my head, I was able to fit like a Hamlin, Blaney, and Kyle Busch lineup together pretty easily. So I think you can go anywhere from one, two, three dominators this week and feel pretty good about it. And that's pretty much it. There's nothing special about this track, and I think we can get to the driver by driver breakdown. It's just your typical 1.5 mile track, multi dominators, and you fill it in with some place differential guys, high finishing guys, and some cheap guys for the most part. So. I think with that being said, we can get to the driver-by-driver driver breakdown, which I know is everyone's favorite part of the video. And a lot of people probably just skipped to this part, so if that was you, welcome to the video. <laughs> We're going to be covering the Kansas race this weekend. So, up top, we'll start with Chase Elliott, 11,200. He is starting first, and I was a little bit surprised when Chase Elliott was the most expensive driver on the slate, because typically, we see the guy starting in first, unless it's like a Kevin Harvick or Denny Hamlin or someone like that. They tend to get priced out a little bit, but they priced Chase Elliott all the way up to 11200 and maybe it's because he's coming off a win last week. That might be the reason why. But I was just a little bit shocked. But I, I think he's a good play, but i got to be honest. The price tag is its making me not like him as much as I feel like I should. Because looking at his numbers at Kansas, he's very good. He actually has the best average finish of all drivers here of 5.8. He's got a win. He's got four top fives, which is very good. He's a dominator here as well. Not as much as some of the other guys. Actually, the... Uh, 
what? So he's only behind. He's actually only above Keselowski in this 10K and above tier in lap sled at 15 and a half per race. He's below Truex, Hamlin, and Kevin Harvick, which makes sense. And only 10 and a half fast laps per race, which is actually the worst of this driver group. But still, Chase Elliott, he's been very good at Kansas. He's been very good at the 1.5 mile tracks this season. He's actually second in average green flag speed this year at this track type. And if you guys want to, so I have the average green flag speed on my spreadsheet. I ha, you can sort that by the tire combination. You can sort that by the track type. You can sort that by pretty much everything. So that's all listed there. If you guys are interested in something I use heavily this season, which because we don't have any practice data, which sucks. So I've been kind of relying on the uh, average green flag speed ratings this year. So if you want that, that's on the green flags green flag speed cheat sheet. If I have some numbers off the top of my head, I'll try to pull them off here for you guys. But uh, if not. <laughs> I guess I just won't bring it up. But I do like Chase Elliott. It's just that price tag, it's tough. And I don't. I wouldn't say I like him more than guys like Truex, Hamlin, Harvick just because he, they get a little bit of PD upside. And overall, I just I have a little bit more confidence in them like winning the race and just picking up dominator points. Now, with Chase Elliott being on the pole, he should lead until the competition caution. But after that, it's anyone's guess who's going to grab the lead. And we've seen multiple times this year where the pole setter, once they lose the lead, they're not getting it back. And it's pretty much just a wasted pick. And that's even happened with guys like Kevin Harvick before, who's been obviously the best driver this year. So Chase Elliott, I think he's a good play, but he's certainly not a must-have. I think you can definitely go other ways, and I wouldn't even say you have to absolutely play him in cash games because that's a pretty massive price tag. And I feel like at some point we're going to get a Truex, we're going to get a Hamlin, a Harvick, a, maybe a Keselowski, a Blaney, a Bush, a Logano up front. So I wouldn't say Chase out is a must-play, and I hate that price tag, and especially starting first. There is, there is a lot of risk there, and he's very good at this track, and I think he could have the lead, and if he leads the entire first stage and gets a good finish... Yeah, it should be able to pay off. Just I'm a little bit wary on that price tag, so I'm not sure. I, he's definitely not going to be my highest on dominator. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not obviously not build lineups yet, but I have a hard time seeing me having more Chase Elliott over someone like Denny Hamlin or Kevin Harvick just because of their price points, and they're starting a little bit further back. But Elliott has been good at the 1.5-mile tracks this season. Nearly 30 laps led per race. He actually has the second most fast laps. He has a win and overall some very strong numbers. It's just that price tag is... Uh, it's just a little bit worrisome for me. And I just have some bad memories of pulse hitters not doing too well for me as well. Anyway, dropping down to Martin Truex Jr. He's 11,000. He is starting fifth. He was great here back in July. Had one of the best cars, and this is a very good track for him. And he's pretty much good at every single 1.5-mile track. That's just what Martin Truex Jr. is. He is a 1.5-mile track dominator. So anytime we head to a 1.5-mile track, we should have interest in MTJ. And just looking at the numbers at Kansas, JGR as a whole typically runs very well here. You're going to see good numbers for Truex. You're going to see good numbers for Hamlin, Kyle Busch, and Derek Jones. So they're all on my radar, and they actually all did run pretty well here in the July race. So it was nice that that carried over last race here. So I would expect that once again. I expect them once again to have a pretty strong running here. And Truex starting fifth, I mean, he's going to be one of the threats to one of the biggest threats to win this race and dominate. He's averaging 60 point. 62.2 DraftKings points per race here. The second best average finish of six. He's got a win, four top fives, some of the most laps led per race at 30.2, some of the most fast laps. He's done very well at these track, track types so far this season. Actually hasn't won at a large oval track or a 1.5 mile track this season, but he's gotten a lot of laps led, a lot of fast laps, and a lot of top fives, and one of the best, some of the best numbers all around. So Truex, starting fifth. I think is a fine option, and I feel like I like Truex just a little bit more than Chase Elliott. Again, these are kind of just my first instinct thoughts here, but you get a little bit of a discount, you get some more PD upside, and I think Truex could certainly catch Elliott at some point and dominate, and if he's going to do that, he'll end up being a better play than Chase Elliott, and you're certainly not playing both in the same lineup. I mean, maybe, maybe some lineups you are, because look, if they both came out and led 100 laps, yeah, they'll be in the optimal, so I guess I should take that back where you can't play both. You'll, I might have some lineups with both, it's just it probably won't look the best because you're definitely going to have to get two punts in there and you might have to go with another 6 or 7K guy. So it's going to look a little bit top-heavy, but they're good plays. It's just their price tags are they're not, they're not my favorite. They're not my favorite, but they are good plays. Uh, Denny Hamlin, 10,600. He's starting 7th. Out of the three guys we talked about so far, I would say he's my favorite. He was great here back in July. I mean, he led a ton of laps, ended up winning the race, and he also won the last race here at Kansas. So that's back-to-back -back wins at Kansas for Denny Hamlin. And we get a little bit of a discount here off of Truex and uh, Chase Elliott, and he's also starting a little bit farther back. And if you're looking at his numbers at Kansas, very, very strong like all the other JGR cars, but an average finish of 7th. 
uh, two wins, four top fives, the second most laps led per race, decent amount of fast laps as well. He's ran very well at the 1.5 mile tracks this season with two wins and five top fives, which is actually more than any driver, and some of the most laps led and fast laps. So Denny Hamlin, he checks pretty much every single box for me, and with the I mean, the races are dwindling down, so I think we're going to see Kevin Harvick, Denny Hamlin pretty much dial in. Those are your two championship favorites, and they should both have some pretty strong races here coming up. So definitely like Denny Hamlin, 10,600, one of my more favorite drivers on this slate. And Kevin Harvick, 10,400, he's starting fourth. I'm surprised he's actually only the fourth highest uh, priced driver because we usually see Kevin Harvick at the very top for the most part, but... Uh, I mean, I think we should probably just take advantage of this. He's very good at Kansas. He's averaging the most DraftKings points per race here, the best average running position, the best driver rating. He's got a win. Only two top fives, but the most laps led per race, the most fast laps, and he's just crushing these track types this year, averaging over 70 DraftKings points per race. He's got four wins, the best driver rating, seven top fives, ten top tens, and a ten-race sample size. So he's not finished outside of the top ten at large oval so far this season, the most laps led and just the most fast laps, which is pretty much going to be the common theme here. Even if we go to the 20, 20 1.5-mile tracks, here, I can pretty much say he's nearly first in every single category. So at Kevin Harvick at 10,400, I think we're getting a little bit of a discount on him, and he can easily get up front here pretty quick. So definitely have quite a bit of interest in Kevin Harvick. He did start in the pole here in the July race, and I think he only ended up leading like nine laps, and he finished fourth, which is not a terrible race, but... It wasn't enough to, to make the optimal, but I'm liking Kevin Harvick quite a bit. And keep in mind, that race was at the night in nighttime as well, and Kevin Harvick has been better during the day. So I'm definitely a fan of Kevin Harvick this week. Brad Keselowski, 10,100. He's starting eighth. I view him more of a as more of a tournament play. I would say he's my least favorite driver out of the five guys we talked about so far. I'd have him below... I would say Kevin Harvick, Denny Hamlin are probably the one-two guys here. Then Chase Elliott, Martin Truex are kind of your tier two. Then I would say Keselowski is kind of the tier three. But I like him in tournaments because I feel like he's going to be kind of the forgotten guy. But he is good at Kansas. I mean, he's got good numbers, just not as good as the guys listed above him. But he's got a win. And actually, the, the past six winners at Kansas all come from this 10K plus tier, which I guess would make sense. But he's a fine option. It's just he doesn't excite me as much as Harvick, Hamlin, Truex, or Elliott. He's been fine at these track types this season. He's got a very good average finish. Actually, the best, or not the best in the entire field, the second best right behind Ryan Blaney. He's got a win. Only two top fives, but eight top tens. And the thing is, he just really hasn't been much of a dominator at these track types this year. I mean, only 12 laps led per race, which you compare it to everyone in this 10K and up tier. It's quite lower and also the least amount of fast laps as well. And starting eighth, I feel like he's going to be a top five contender. It's just I have a hard time seeing him really get up front over the likes of some other guys on this slate. Uh, dropping down to Kyle Busch, 9,900. He's starting 20th. It's scary to say, but I would, I'm going to have to say that he's one of my favorite plays this weekend because he's starting 20th and he's below 10K. I thought for sure when I saw Kyle Busch was starting 20th this week that he was going to probably be above, uh, not above 11K, but around $11,000. And surprisingly, that's not the case. And we're getting a very good price tag on him. And the thing is, he actually had one of his dominator race, races and the July race here on July 23rd. And Kyle Busch has not dominated many races this season. He's done it at Bristol a couple of times. And then at Kansas, I believe he led around, wasn't around 30 laps, I believe. And he picked up a lot of fast laps as well. I believe it was around 20 fast laps, which I want to say was the second most. It was pretty spread out, those the dominator points. But Kyle Busch... He looked very good, and like I said, this is a JGR track. They run very well here. Kyle Busch has the second-best average running position of 6.6, .6, only behind Kevin Harvick. Hasn't won here recently in the past six races, but two top fives, four top tens. He also led quite a bit of laps here at 27.5 per race and 28.3 fast laps, which is second only behind Kevin Harvick. Now, his numbers this season at the 1.5-mile tracks. The dominator points, they're low. Only nine laps led per race and 11.3 fast laps, but he's getting good finishes. He's got three top fives, average finish of 11th, running position of 11. It's just, he hasn't been a guy you can really count on to dominate, but starting 20th, you get a nice floor here, and he should be a top five contender, and he's below 10K, so I'm liking this price tag on Kyle Busch, and he makes an excellent, excellent pairing with someone like Kevin Harvick, Denny Hamlin, Chase Elliott, Martin Truex, because then you can lock up the early dominator points with those guys. Then Kyle Busch should be more of a factor in the second Porsche, or the second half of this race, and also the competition caution, we'll, we'll be able to allow him to get up front even quicker. So Busch, at starting 20th, at a good track for him. I'm a big fan of him this week, as scary as that sounds. 
Uh, Ryan Blaney, 9700, starting ninth. Another one of my favorite plays on this slate. So I guess two of my favorite guys here, Kyle Busch and Ryan Blaney, they're right next to each other. But just looking at the numbers alone, Ryan Blaney should be one of the best plays, assuming all the speed that he's had over the course of the season carries over to another 1.5 mile track. Because he, I posted a tweet on uh, Twitter, I think a couple of days ago, of how good Ryan Blaney has been at these 1.5 mile tracks. And he's absolutely crushing it. He ranks first in every single statistical category besides one. And I believe that was average lap slide. I think he's third in that category. Other than that, he is first. The most DraftKings points per race. The best average finish, running position, all that. He's just been great. You know, he doesn't have any wins at them yet. And that's mostly due to just him being unlucky. But at 97, Hunter Strike 9th, you get a little bit of PD upside. And I would expect him to contend to get the lead here. I think he's probably going to be a top five contender here. And it would not surprise me if he ends up getting up front. Now, don't let this average finish of 20th of this track deter you here. Because he's getting a little bit unlucky. But he's got one of the best average running positions of 8.1. Only behind Kyle Busch and Kevin Harvick. He's also got a top five finish here and two top tens. But I'm mostly interested in how he's done this season, the 1.5. So like I mentioned very, very good, and I'll let you guys see it for yourselves. I mean, dark green bars all around here. Doesn't have any wins, but four top five, 30.8 laps lap per race, and the most fast laps at 27.1 per race. And he's just been so, so good at these. And he's first in average green flag speed at the 1.5s, first in this tire combination, I believe, or at least close to it. Again, I, I'd have to remember off the top of my head. I know for sure he's first in just average green flag speed overall at these types of tracks. I, mean, I can't remember if it's in the tire combination, but I think it is. I think he's at 3.9. So I love Ryan Blaney. Starting ninth, now it's a bit of a steep price tag at 9700, but the way he's ran at these types of tracks, he should be he should be around the Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick price range. So uh, as always, I'm a big fan of Ryan Blaney, and I really am this week. Uh, Joe Lugano, 9500. He's starting second. I think he's an interesting pivot off of Chase Elliott up top because if you don't think Chase Elliott's going to lead the early laps, I guess Joe Lugano could be in contention for leading those early laps. Now it's not a forgiven gun, a given. I forget the saying I was supposed to say, but it's not a yeah foregone con conclusion. Sorry, that Joey Logano is going to lead the early laps because we could always see someone like uh, Martin Truex or Kevin Harvick get a really good jump and they end up just getting the lead and leading half the race. But Logano, he's not terrible at Kansas, but he's definitely not the best, and he's actually got the worst numbers we've seen so far out of all these guys just going down the list, like average running position wise, and just overall just hasn't had the strongest numbers. But he has been a lap leader here, 22.8 laps led per race. Not a lot of fast laps, though. But he's ran well at these types of tracks this season. He's been pretty good at the low tire wear, 1.5-mile tracks. Does have a win at these track, track types this season. But overall, not the strongest numbers. But he's capable of dominating, and I like that price point. So he's an interesting GPP dominator. But I'm not really going to go there in cash games. But with his price tag, I'll definitely have some exposure just in case he happens to get the lead and doesn't lose it for quite some time. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, 9,200, starting 14. So we kind of got, got all the dominators out of the way after Joey Logano because I can't really see anybody else in this, anyone else below uh, 9,500 really dominating, maybe outside of an Alex Bowman just because he's ran well at these types of tracks and at Kansas specifically. So maybe besides Bowman, I just can't see anyone else really dominating. So let's dive into it now. So uh, we have Jimmy Johnson, 9,200. He's starting 14th. This hasn't been a great track for him. Doesn't have any wins here recently. Doesn't even have a top five recently. But he does have two top ten finishes. But he has ran well at 1.5 mile tracks this season. But not really enough just to really justify playing him at $9,200 only starting 14. Do I think he's going to be a top ten contender? Sure. But that's not really going to do it enough for me at $9,200. Like if I can get someone like Logano for $300 more or Blaney for $500 more that have dominator potential... I'd much rather go that route than paying over $9,000 for Jimmy Johnson. So definitely not one of my favorite plays this week. If you want to go there in tournaments, just like a sprinkle in your uh, your builds, sure. But outside of that, I wouldn't really go there in single entries or three entry max contests. Uh, William Byron, $9,000. He is starting 10th. And again, just not one of my favorite plays here. Like It's just a tough to really justify these guys because if you're – playing them you're probably sacrificing someone like Bush, Blaney, Logano, Keselowski because it's going to be hard to build lineups with Elliott, Truex, Sam, one those guys and then pairing them with another dominator then pairing them with some of these 9k guys so I'm probably not going to have much of Jimmy Johnson or William Byron here or even Clint Boyer when we get to that but I think Byron 
he's just an interesting tournament play. He does have a top five finish here, but if we're looking at his numbers at the 1.5s this season, he's got zero top five finishes, only two top tens, average rank position at 15.3. I'm just not really on William Byron too much this weekend. Clint Boer, 8,800. It is his home track, and he actually does run pretty well here. But again, it's hard to pay $9,000 for him. If he was a bit cheaper, sure. He's got an average finish of right around where he's starting. He's got top five, two top tens, and five top 15s, which is fine. But again, it's not enough to pay off a $9,000 price tag. I don't see him sneaking into the top five. I can't imagine he's going to lead any laps here. And if you're looking at his track... Uh, form here at the 1.5 mile tracks he's got zero top five finishes and zero top 10 finishes this season at 1.5 six top 15 so he's probably gonna finish anywhere from like 12th to 15th place but that's just not enough at nine thousand dollars so probably won't have much clint even though this is his home track alex bowman 8600 he's starting six i think he's an interesting gpp dominator and the thing is he's pretty cheap as well he's averaging nearly 45 draft these points per race here Average finish of 9.6, has a top 5, 3 top 10s, actually has led some laps here before as well, including this July race where he ran very well. And he actually had the second most laps led at, at, I think it was like 28 or 30. So Bowman does run pretty well at Kansas, and if you're looking at his numbers this season at these track types, it's been pretty good for Bowman. The problem is he usually runs into issues where he doesn't end up getting good finishes. Like He's got a very good average running position of 9.7. That's, that's top 10 for sure. It's close to top 5. But an average finish of nearly 20th place. He only has one top five finish in the season, only two top 10s and four top 15s. But he's got some of the most laps led and some of the most fast laps. He's just getting very unlucky and he can't seem to put together a full race. But starting sixth at 8,600, I wish he was a little bit cheaper. But I'm going to have a little bit of a little bit of exposure to Alex Bowman just because I think there's maybe a small chance he could get up front and dominate. And it's a pretty good price tag as well. Then Eric Jones, 8,400, starting 11. So he's part of that JGR uh, team, which does run pretty well here. And he actually did make the recent optimal lineup here in July. He finished in fifth place. It was either fourth or fifth place, but he ran pretty well. He started 21st. But the past six races for Eric Jones, he's finished in the top five 50% of the time. And all but one race, he's finished inside the top 10. So starting 11th, I feel like that'll keep his ownership down a little bit. But I think he's a pretty interesting GPP play because I do think he has top five potential. And starting 11th, it's not going to keep too many people on him because that is a tough starting position and you have some nice pd plays like Almarola, reddick mdb dylan below him even christopher bell so i don't think eric jones exposure is going to be through the roof here i think he's a pretty interesting tournament play and then going down to kurt bush at 8200 he is starting third again he runs pretty well at kansas it's just he's starting third and i can't see him getting up front if he happens to randomly get up front you're going to want some exposure to him because if he leads like 25, 30 some laps at 8,200 and he gets a strong finish, which he probably will at Kansas, that might be enough. So I wouldn't say a full fade the guy. Maybe just throw a couple, uh, ex a couple of lineups in there with him. Because looking at his numbers at Kansas, he's got an average finish of eighth, which is actually some of the best out of all these drivers. He's got two top five finishes and five top tens. Not really a lap leader here, but some strong numbers at Kansas. And he has been running very well at the large oval tracks this season. He's got three top five finishes, and he's finished in the top ten the past ten races at these large ovals this season. I'm not sure exactly what the entire sample size is, but I think it might be ten. Although it might be pulling in a race from last season. But either way, Kurt Busch, he's been very consistent. He doesn't really knock your socks off with, like, amazing, amazing performances, but... Average finish of 9.3 to the 1.5s this year. Actually did pick up a win at Las Vegas. Three top fives, seven top tens. And I expect him to have a strong running here. Should get a top 10 finish. It's just, you kind of, if you're playing Kurt Busch, you're kind of just hoping there's an off chance where he gets up front and leads some laps. I don't think it's likely, but 8,200, I think it's worth maybe having him in a couple of lineups. Eric Amarola, he's 8,000, starting 16th. Pretty good track for him. Doesn't have a top five finish here the past six races, but he's got four top 10s and five top 15s with an average finish of 11.5. If you're looking at his numbers this year at the 1.5 mile tracks, only one top five finishes, but four top 10s. Actually has 18.1 lap sled. Now, a lot of that's due to him absolutely just leading a ton of laps at one of these tracks, but still, he's been pretty solid this season, and I'd expect him to be a top 10 contender and starting 16th at $8,000. That's enough to have quite a bit of interest in Eric Amarola. Tyler Reddick at 7,800. He's starting 15th. Actually has two races here, and he has an average finish of 11th place. And he ran pretty well here back in July as well. And if we're looking at his numbers this season at the 1.5s, he's been pretty consistent, averaging 40 DraftKings points per race. He's got two top fives, four top 15s, and six top, or sorry, four top 10s and six top 15s with eight top 20s. 
I feel like he's going to finish close to where he's starting, but we know with Tyler Reddick, he has top 10 potential. He's seen it quite a few times so far this season. He even has top 5 potential, and if he can get that, you know, the upper part of the track working, he should have a very strong race. So I like Reddick in tournaments. Probably not going to get there in cash games, but I do think he's a pretty decent tournament option. MDB, 7,700. He's starting 18th. Look, his track history here, it's not going to make anyone want to play him because it's horrendous. But keep in mind, he only has one race here in good equipment, and then he wrecked out of that race. So I'm not really putting any stock into his recent track history. I'm kind of more interested in how he's ran at the 1.5-mile tracks this season, which have been a lot better. An average running position of 13.4, drive rating of 86.8, three top five finishes and five top 15s. Starting 18th and only $7,700, I think he's a fine place differential play. I'm not expecting fireworks out of MDB, but I think he should contend for a top 15, top 12, maybe even a top 10 finish. Austin Dillon, 7,500, starting 17th. Okay track history here. Average finish is 17.7, but he's got two top 15s, and he's pretty much in the top 20 each and every single time. But his numbers at 1.5 mile tracks this season, and I feel like I've said the word 1.5 mile tracks like 80 times in this video, so I'm sorry if it sounds redundant, but... I just got to keep saying it. So, anyway, if you look at his numbers at these track types this season, it's been very strong for Dillon. He actually has a win, which kind of got a little bit lucky there, but it still counts. Two top fives, four top tens, and seven top 15. So, we know he's typically going to be running inside the top 15. And starting 17th at 7,500, he's got some top 10 potential there, and I think he's worthy of a play because we don't have a ton of good place differential plays. Like, there would be some weeks we get Jones starting in the 20s, Bo or not Bowman really, but Byron in the 20s, Jimmy Johnson in the 20s. Like last week, we had a lot of good PD plays. Not really the case this week. So a lot of these mid-range plays are kind of guys you're hoping where they finish where they start or just grab a couple of place differential spots. I'm not expecting these guys to really get huge PD points. So it's kind of a weird week in that because we really don't have many good PD plays at all in this 9k and below range until we start getting to these 6k guys for the most part so they always they're gonna feel a little bit more gpp but we're gonna have to play them because we're always stuck using some 7k guys and 8k guys to fill out the rest of our lineup uh ricky Senow starting 23rd he's 7400 uh not loving ricky here he does have a top five finish at kansas and four top or i'm sorry not at kansas a top five finish at these types of tracks this season and four top 20s but it's not the greatest. He does have four top 20 finishes at Kansas and two top 15s, which is fine. And I believe he was sixth in average green flag speed here in the July race. But his day was ended early, so it's a little bit skewed. Because if you look at the green flag speed ratings and guys that wreck out early, they can kind of be skewed in their favor. So I'm not going to really put too much stock into that. But starting 23rd, he should be able to contend for a top 20. He typically does that at this track. Should get a top... I shouldn't say should get a top 15. He should get 10 for a 15th to 20th place finish, which is fine starting 23rd. It's just I kind of like the upside more of Austin Dillon, MDB, Reddick, Omarola. I just feel like they have much higher finishing potential than Ricky Stenhouse Jr. does. Chris Rebell, 7,200, starting 22nd. He's a bit of a mixed bag. Like, we see some weeks where he's running inside the top 10. And I feel like every single time I faded him when he was $12,000, he got a top 5 every time. And then when I play the guy at like 6,000, 7,000, he just wrecks out or finishes like 30th. So I can't get Chris Bell right. Just one of those guys that doesn't like me for some reason. But he had one race here. He finished 23rd at a running position of 18.6. He's starting 22nd. He should be able to contend for a top 20, maybe a top 15 finish. If you're looking at his numbers this season, the 1.5s. Hasn't cracked the top 5, but he does have three top 10 finishes three top 15s and four top 20s. He's a fine PD play, and there's really kind of a lack of PD plays in this entire 8 and 7K range. So Bell's okay. He's not going to like blow you away in projections, but he's he's got a, an okay floor there, I guess. Uh, Cole Custer, 7,000, starting 13th. One race here again because he's a rookie, but he did finish 7th and got 54.5 DraftKings points. That's going to look pretty darn good on the spreadsheet, but against only a one-race sample size. But it's not like he's been bad at these types of tracks this season. He actually does have a win, but 7 top 20 finishes and 3 top 15s. He should be a 10th to 20th place car here, which is fine, but starting 13th, this is a bit of a risky play there, not someone I'm going to expect to be too heavy on. Yeah, he could contend for a top 10, but I feel like it's more likely he loses spots than if he gain, than him gaining spots. And dropping down to the 6K range, we have Bubba Wallace, 6,900. He is starting 24th. Looking at his numbers at Kansas, it's not been pretty. Only averaging 1.4 DraftKings points per race with an average finish of 30th and a running position of 25.8. Looking at his numbers at these tra type tr types of tracks this season, 
He's got three top 20 finishes, one top 10, and three top 15. Earlier this season at Kansas, he wrecked and finished, I believe, around 35th, 30th, I think maybe 37th. I think 37 sounds about right when I was looking at it. So it's not been great for Bubba. Starting 24th, though, he's he's got some upside. It's, I mean, he's been running decently well this season. It's just, if you're looking at his average running position at these track types this season, that's 23.5, which is half a spot higher than his qualifying spot. So, I mean, maybe I have some Bubba Wallace, Wallace lineups, but it won't be anything too crazy. Uh, Chris Buescher, 6,700, starting 21st. He's actually been good at Kansas. He's got two top 10 finishes here, three top 15s and four top 20s with an average finish of 18.7. Looking at how he's done at these tracks this season, he's actually got five top 20s, three top 15s, average finish of 19.2, and an average running position of 19.1. So I think he's fine. He did crash out of this race in the July one, so you can't really put too much stock into that, but... I think he should contend, or should finish close to where he starts. Maybe he gains a couple of spots, which is okay at 6,700. We just don't have many good PD plays. Although Matt Kent is starting 30th. He's a good PD play. He's starting, not starting 6,600. He's starting 30th at 6,600. And I actually think he's a fine play here now. Past three races, you can't really use this because it was in different equipment. So I'm not going to look at the recent track history. But if we look at his numbers at the 1.5s this season, it's not great. But keep in mind, he's cheap and starting 30th, but he's got an average finish of 21st, running position of 22.3, a top 15 finish, and four top 20s. We're going to need some salary relief, and we're going to need a PD play here. So starting 30th, I think that is totally fine. I do like Matt Kenseth. Uh, Ryan Newman, 6,500. He's starting all the way back in 28th. Looking at his numbers at Kansas, it has not been too pretty for Ryan Newman, only averaging 3.8 DraftKings points per race with an average finish of 28th and a running position of 21.8. He's been just slow this year. If you're looking at the numbers of the 1.5s, average finish of 20.3, running position of 20.7, three top 15s and five top 20s. So that's fine. He should be a 15th to 25th place car. So at 6,500, I would expect him to gain spots unless he happens to wreck out. So he's just these are just kind of the guys you throw in at the end to fill out the rest of your lineups. I don't really have a strong lean on any of these guys. They're just there to fill out the end of your lineups and allow you to fit in your dominators. Ryan Pree, 6,300. He's starting 19th. I feel like you can definitely be underweight on Ryan Priest. I mean, if maybe he holds his position and gains a spot or two, gets a little bit lucky there, that'll be fine. 6,300, he should have low ownership, so I think he's fine in tournaments. But risky play there for Ryan Priest starting 19th. I mean, if you're looking at his numbers this season at these track types, running position of 24.6, which is five spots further back, and only one top 20 finish. So I don't have much confidence in Ryan Priest. John Hunter Nemechek, 6,100. He's starting 32nd, finished 19th here earlier in the earlier in the season. And at these track types this season, average finish of around 21st place. So starting 32nd, I actually think he's a pretty strong play. He's got five top 20 finishes and one top 15. So John Hunter Nemechek, yeah, I think he's pretty interesting. I mean, he can't really lose spots for the most part. I don't think he's going to finish behind Yaley, Timmy Hill, Josh Balicki, James Davison. Although he does wreck every single week. I mean, we call him, we don't call him John Hunter Nima wreck for no reason at all. He tends to get a caution or cause something each and every single week. But I think as long as he hopefully stays clean, he should be a pretty good PD play. Uh, Ty Dillon, 5,900. He's starting 25th. He's got two top 20 finishes here, but it's nothing too spectacular. This season at the 1.5s, it's been pretty ugly for him. It's pretty much an average running position of right around where he's starting. So I'm not expecting a lot out of Ty Dillon. I'd say he finishes anywhere from 20th to like 27th place, something around there. So not a lot of upside for Ty Dillon. Michael McDowell, I do like more than Ty Dillon for sure. Only $5,700, and it's not a bad track for him. He did run well here. Run well. I think I said well. Run well here in the July race, and he's got three top 20 finishes. He finished in the top 20 earlier this season with a 16th place finish. So McDowell's certainly on my cheap driver radar for sure. I mean... Four top 20 uh, finishes this season at the 1.5 mile tracks and two top 15s with an average finish of 21.7. So McDowell, definitely on my radar. Daniel Suarez, 5,600, starting 27th. Probably right around where he's, go- where he's going to finish. He wasn't even good here in good equipment for the most part. <laughs> we had one top 15 and two top 20s. And now he's in awful equipment in the lawnmower. So I don't really have much confidence in Daniel Suarez this season at these track types. One top 20 and an average running position of 29.2. So... Not a, lot of whole lot of, not a whole lot of upside there for Daniel Suarez. But Corey the Joy, 5,400, starting 29th. He's been much better than Suarez. He's just a little bit cheaper and starting further back. He's got an average finish of 23rd at these track types with three top 20 finishes. And he's actually ran decently well at these low tire wear 1.5 mile tracks. So the Joy, throw me on my radar as a cheap option. And I feel like he should be closer to 6K than he is to 5K. So 
Then after you get below LaJoy, I can't really recommend playing any of these guys. These guys just don't make optimal lineups. If you're looking at the optimal lineup tab on my spreadsheet, you're not going to see these guys pop up ever, unless it's like a super speedway where you have Brennan Poole pop up a couple of times. But outside of that, these guys will not make the optimal lineup. So Davis and Yaley, Hill, Balicki, Gase, Fincham, Poole, Sorensen, Quinalf, I feel like you can just cross them off your radar and feel pretty good about it unless something crazy happens and there's a ton of wrecks. But I can't predict their predict there to be Rex unless we're at like a Daytona or Talladega, so I'd probably steer clear, steer clear away from those guys. But with that being said, I think we're done with the video, so I do appreciate you guys watching. If you made it all the way through, let me know. I always love seeing who makes it all the way through in these videos, because they are pretty long, but I know a lot of you say you don't really care about the length, so I just do whatever on here, and the length is what it is. So um, appreciate you guys watching. Hope you guys enjoy the race on Sunday. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. If you just want to leave a nice comment, you can do that as well. If you want to say a mean comment, you can do that too. And leave a like on the video if you haven't already. If you want to follow me on social media, the handles in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. If you want to support the content over on Patreon, links down below for that. But that being said, I'm out of here, guys. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend.